Please welcome Henrietta Four, Senior Managing Partner, Radiate Capital, and Chairman and CEO, Holzman International. Mohammed Nanabe, Managing Partner, Mozilla Ventures, and Moderator, Alfred Ironside, VP for Communications, MIT. Thank you all very much, uh, Henrietta and Mohammed. It's a pleasure to share the stage with you. I want to start with a quick poll. Uh, by a round of applause, um, who in this room was not deeply impressed by what they heard and saw today? Round of applause. No, OK. <laughs> a round of applause. Who was deeply impressed by what they heard? <laughs> okay. So that sets up this conversation because we have um, a lot of very uh, capable and worthy teams who have come to be a part of Solve. Uh, they are all um, entrepreneurs, innovators, uh, solvers who want to do good in the world. They want to do big things. They want to see their enterprises grow and have uh, real achievement and impact. So that's not unique. Everyone in the house is into that. So. The question for you as investors, and many in this room are investors like you, um, what do you think about when you think about putting money into uh, leaders and organizations who are on this mission to create impact and uh, achieve scale in what they're, they're doing? So uh, Mohammed, I'll just start with you in terms of how, you running the Mozilla Ventures $35 million fund, you have dozens of organizations that you're supporting, how do you get a feel uh, for the kinds of organizations and leaders who you think are going to get there? So, you know, for us, we, we're really taking a look at uh, trying to understand what's the impact we'd like to see in the world. Um, and then, you know, find entrepreneurs, founders, um, and the companies that they run that can help us see that change in the world. Um, for Mozilla, we have a manifesto that's public. It's online. We've got a set of principles, um, how we think about responsible technology, a healthy internet, uh, user rights, and so on. So we've sat back and we've taken that manifesto and said, how do we turn this into a tool to use for investing? Um, which, of course, you know, as you're a nonprofit and you take principles, uh, it's not quite straightforward. Um, but what we really tried to do was say, if we use this as a prism to look at uh, companies that people were starting, could we take those principles and hold people up against them and ask ourselves the question, are they advancing something meaningfully um, that we think is important and should exist in the world? Mm -hmm. um, and if the answer is yes, you know, can we make an argument for why that should exist and why we should support them? Mm -hmm. um, and then look at all the you know, normal business uh, metrics and, you know, uh, would companies be successful, and do they have a path to market, and so on, um, and try to support them. So we're very much thinking first about impact, um, and then about what the investment that we'll make and what the shape of it will look like. So let me go a little bit further on that, um, because that's, a, that's an early screen, right? Who's going to help you achieve yep. the mission and principles that Mozilla stands for? And then you're applying um, another set of screens about whether you think they have what it takes. So say a little bit about. Um, not those basic screens, but what's the special sauce? Are there things, are there particular things that you're looking for in the, um, in the enterprises that you're supporting? Yeah, you know, we, we're looking for um, really people with grit and determination, but more importantly, a passion for solving the problem that they see in front of them. Um, I think they really, you know, entrepreneurship's a long journey. It's a hard journey, whether it's on the for-profit side or non-profit side. Um, You're speaking to the converted, I think. I, 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 everybody sitting here knows this journey. Um, so I think, you know, uh, you know, it's easy to say people should have grit, like everybody says this. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the time when you're really looking at, you know, uh, struggling and making payroll and all those things that you do early on um, and late on as well, you know, you, you need to have that fundamental belief that what you're working on is meaningful um, and then it's going to make the world better. Um, and change the world for the positive. Um, I think that's the only reason people get involved in these types of ventures. You know, otherwise, you know, you can go out, become an investment banker or whatever mm -hmm. that other path might be. Um, but I think if you're really trying to solve problems in the world and make it a better place, that passion needs to come out. I'm seeing some nodding heads here in the room. <laughs> um, Henrietta, the same question for you. So 
you are starting a, a, a venture fund um, to support social enterprise, and that's exciting um, with other women leaders who've had the kind of experience you've had. And your experience is really interesting. Um, the, the head of USAID, the head of UNICEF. So you're coming at this from a slightly different angle, which is not pure social investment, but also uh, the role of large government uh, organizations, intergovernmental organizations, in supporting um, social enterprise. So what are you looking for um, when you're thinking about the kinds of organizations that you think will get there? Um, so it's great to be here, first of all. Uh, I, I believe that the world needs to scale more. So to Mohammed's good points, uh, what we need are many of these products and services that can really change the world. And so part of our responsibility for those who are a little bit older is to make sure that we can scale all these good ideas and companies. And it means you're going to need public and private funds. We're going to have to get some funding systems that are transparent and that cross public and private lines. Um, you all know the problems that we're having in the developing world for national debts. Uh, it is serious. It means that there will be many ministries that won't have money to spend on new health products. Uh, they just can't afford it. So couldn't public and private money pair? It could. And so I think one of our responsibilities is to try to connect those worlds for the entrepreneur. And so every one of us in this room has a way of helping in that. But that would be my number one. Number two is choose some big platforms that can scale. And think about some of the infrastructure products that can change the world. Uh, when I was at UNICEF, we were trying to make sure that lower satellites could connect every school in the world to the internet. And if it could, then it means that the village hospital and it means that the businesses around the school could be connected to the internet and that families would go there in the evening and they would realize both the importance of school, but also they could check the farming prices or anything else that they needed. So think of some of the things that could just change our world and try to back those so that in public and private money, you can get the platforms that all the young and smaller entrepreneurs need. But I think that's our responsibility. I thank you for that. And I want to I wanna go right to that theme of public and private um, because it's, let me, let me make an assertion and see if you agree or disagree. The assertion would be that there are two basic pathways to scale for enterprises like this. Real scale, we're talking about um, systemic change, uh, large scale change. So one pathway is markets. Um, and many in this room are starting as market-based organizations trying to grow and earn an income and make a profit, make themselves sustainable. Um, and you grow and scale through markets if you're um, serving a need. Uh, and you have good luck and determination, and you start to sort of organically grow. The other pathway, I would assert, is um, the endorsement and support of governments. And I don't know whether you think both those pathways are both legitimate pathways for scaling. Um, and I, I have a suspicion that when we talk about social enterprises, there's a tendency to run away from government. Government's part of the problem. So I just want to talk a, a little bit through that question of pathways to scale. Let me start with first with you, Mohammed. Yeah, well, you know, I think it, um, a large part of it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, in my, my previous life, uh, I was with uh, an organization that in the funded independent media. And we often were, uh, didn't want the government involved anywhere with these companies because you had a tendency in most many countries, and, and unfortunately, increasingly more countries where um, oligarchs and illiberal countries will try to strangle the independent media. And one of the ways you do it is by government taking control through a pension fund to buy the assets of you know, the last remaining newspaper or whatever that might be. Um, so in, in certain problem sets, you don't want government involved and government money involved because it corrupts uh, the solution you're trying to work for. So I think it, you know, it very much, so sorry, it's a hedge answer, but it depends, right? Um, so sometimes, yes, you know, there's utility in working with government. Um, I think it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Right. Henrietta, again. So I'm going to take um, an example out of India. I saw the Clean India, the Swachh Bharat um, program that some of you know. I see a few nodding heads. 
uh, and it really spurred entrepreneurism in the water and sanitation. So its purpose was to make sure that there would be um, bathrooms in villages so you could have it at the local school. But it created this burst of uh, entrepreneurial activity. There were so many women who opened up shops about various types of toilets and bathrooms, uh, faucets and basins, but it, it was entrepreneurial. But it was a government program to clean India, to make sure that there would be um, a cleaner, more healthy environment, both rurally and in urban. But companies uh, can pair with countries in programs like that, if you just think big enough and you put some funding behind it mm -hmm. so that entrepreneurs can start experimenting and, and um, creating products and services. Mm -hmm. And it creates momentum in the country. Right, so I'm hearing, I think both pathways are legitimate ones, um, for sure. Let's talk about public-private. Um, I guess the one you're describing in India was something of an example in that regard. It was public money spurring private enterprise. I'm just curious, um, for those of you in the room who are solvers, innovators, whether a public money seems like a, 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 a good solution or a realistic solution for you, or are you mostly looking? Let's start with public. You, public, round of applause. Right. OK. <laughs> a little bit. Private, markets, that kind. Of. <laughs> so a little bit more energy there. OK. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so again, just coming back to the two of you and your experiences um, as investors in different guises, um, maybe a success story, something that um, you put money into that really took off and what you thought really made it happen. And then I'll ask of examples of cases where you really thought it would get there and it didn't. And why do you think that was the case? So. Henrietta, let me go to you this time and see if there's something that's triggered there for you. Well, a failure is triggered. <laughs> <laughs> we learn most from them. Go um, ahead. So um, I was just out of my uh, college, and I was a tennis player. And so my tennis partner and I decided that we would start a company and that we would create tennis greeting cards. Now, you may not have seen tennis greeting cards, so we knew we were into a good sector because no one had thought of it yet. <laughs> so I did the artwork. My partner did the words. We made our cards. We started calling on every greeting card uh, purveyor, every little store. We were so excited when we got our, our orders. And then we began looking at what we had created in terms of the money that came in. And we realized that we had not counted our own time or our gasoline, and that we were getting excited about all these orders, but we actually weren't profitable. So sadly, we learned that we had to close business. So one of the lessons you learn as a young entrepreneur is when to close a business. And it's a really important lesson, but I think um, we all learn it but it's one that we try to teach, especially when you're an early entrepreneur. I'll just note for those who don't know that your family history, your work history really started in family businesses and entrepreneurial businesses, which you still run today. And it was that the foundation for your step into roles in government. So I, you speak of what you know. Um, uh, examples on either side of the equation, Mohammed, something that really took off? or something that didn't quite go where you wanted it or expected it to go? Yeah, so, so I'll, give you, I'll give you one of each. So I think you know, one of the, um, we've, we've met many companies um, working in Africa who all had the idea that there should be a pan-African media product that should exist. Um, and every single company in every single market thought they were the ones who could go mm -hmm. pan-African. And every single one of them failed mm -hmm. in the same way after spending a lot of money. Um, and I think it's, it's always easy to sit back and think whether if you're in Johannesburg or in Nairobi um, or wherever you are that you, what you, the problems you're solving in your market can exist and you can take that and export it to the countries around you. Um, it inevitably it doesn't work. People spend a lot of money doing it. Um, and it's not that the individual newsrooms and news organizations fail in doing this. Um, we failed as well in trying to convince the entrepreneurs that the plans were just going to burn through money and they wouldn't see results. And we saw this happen time and time again. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a bit about 
trying to simplify the understanding of the continent, even though people were from the continent themselves, mm -hmm. um, and not understanding their neighbors. Um, and we really struggled to find good examples where people went in did this well. So that's kind of on the failure side. I think it's really you know, uh, knowing what you know and thinking it applies everywhere without really being able to go and test that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of success, you know, we've, we, we were an early investor in a company called Lalapa AI um, out of South Africa. Um, and the company started building AI solutions um, for the African market and for Africa, but with African talent, with the insight that uh, they were going to be able to have the math, P, uh, math, statistics, AI, computer science talent that would be in Africa, returning to Africa, and they'd be able to start building product there. And they had this insight before this wave of AI that we all now see took off. Um, and it was an early insight. And being able to see the team and seeing that they had this vision, they made, they, you know, and they were able to draw people together um, in Africa and being able to attract them. Um, I think it's going to be one of our key successes, just being able to see the insight they had. Um, and other people just couldn't see what they were seeing. Um, but they were able to convince us, and we were able to believe, one, that Africa could produce um, the talent to tackle you know, the biggest problems in the world that were previously only tackled in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. or in London. Um, and two, they would be able to attract the talent to do that. Right. Thank you. Oh, could I add a, a, something onto this? So, one of the other things that I've seen that builds on Mohammed's thought is we started drone corridors uh, for delivering of blood supplies. And many of the private companies were looking at them for delivery of products. And sometimes you can piggyback onto someone else's technology or company that's in a completely different sector. And you can do something that is for good, for impact. And it will have different economics and financial model. But it's a really interesting way to grow. And so we used many of the telecom companies for birth registration. So when a baby is born that you could take a picture of the baby and you could enter them on the rolls as a person in the country. So, so look for some of those um, um, avenues and they can be very powerful. Yeah, I appreciate that. So we're in our last minute. And I'm glad you both mentioned the things you did um, about AI and uh, and so forth, drones, because the last question I have is really one about looking to the future. Um, if we're looking to the future, what is it you're excited about as an investor? What are you, what are you, what are you excited about, Mohammed? Um, no, right now, we're really, we're really excited about the possibilities of AI um, and where people were able to build things and augment human capability, but in a way that's you know, uh, pro-human rather than in a way that's you know, looking to harvest our data and you know, uh, become a system of oppression to us or reinforce bias that exists in society. Um, so we're looking for people to take novel approaches to be able to say, how can we build and use this technology to benefit people? Um, and to you know, almost in a way, you know, we've got this dominance of big tech and platforms and in some countries of government you know, systems of surveillance. And how do we use this technology to almost help people claim back the internet mm -hmm. um, and claim back the power of technology for themselves. Big challenge. Big challenge, but great people working on uh, solving it. Henrietta. Uh, so I'll go for after school programs. I think there's just been an explosion of after school programs where you can learn a skill and you can learn it on your cell phone and uh, the ability to then break open all the talent in the world is just stunning. Huge need, huge opportunity. And then if I could have a second one, um, it's on mental health. Mental health is the issue of this generation and we've got to try to help every country, everywhere in the world. Uh, there's a program that Spotify created where um, you know many of the cell phones are the cheapest <laughs> ones have advertisements on them. So instead of having an advertisement that is all about a product or service, it's an advertisement that is about good mental health. So they can refer uh, young people who are listening to an NGO for mental health. But this is just, it, this is a huge need. Uh, we've got to be able to find a way to make it uh, remunerative and financially operable, better than tennis greeting cards. <laughs> um, but, but I think it just has huge potential. So I'll name those two. 
I love that we went both to high tech and to people oriented um, services. Really great suggestions. We're out of time. I want to thank both of you, and I want to thank all of you for bringing your energy to this conversation. Thank you. <laughs>